Welcome back to Raw 1251 AM. My name is Harry Law. I'm joined here by my uh, co head of music, Lewis Dobbs, and I'm also joined by uh, Sujana and George, two of the poets for the latest BBC Contained Strong Language Festival. So uh, we have George here, who is a writer, editor, teacher based in Coventry, and uh, recently released a new collection called From Animal Illicit, which was released last year. And we also are here with Sujana who is an amazing multilingual poet, playwright and researcher um, who draws inspiration from her childhood in Nepal, motherhood and global work experience all the way from Sri Lanka and India, uh, and also a trustee of Talking Birds Theatre who currently lives in Warwickshire. How are you guys doing today? Good, thanks. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks for welcoming us on. Yeah, yeah I'm doing really good. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Of course. And so you guys are taking part in the upcoming uh, BBC Contained Strong Language Festival, an art poetry festival designed to uh, take a look at Coventry. And uh, you guys particularly are focusing on the uh, the Green City Poets Project, uh, if, uh, if I'm correct. And essentially that is you guys have taken residency in a, uh, a green or interesting space in Coventry for the past three months and you've been commissioned to do some poetry based on your experience there. Uh, so we just want to talk about that for a bit, if that's OK, um, because residency, it's always had such a huge place in art. You know, over the years, it's it's always been such a, an impactful uh, part of art, whether it's writing, uh, creating, painting, etc. And I just want to ask, how do you feel it affected um, both of you? Uh, Sujana, if you want to start off. Sure. So, so you're talking more about how did the residency impact me and my work? Hmm. And, so and your day-to-day -day yeah. life as well, just how, how do you feel that uh... it's sort of um, fed into my life, so to speak. Yes, so I was, um, I've been the poet in residence at a nature reserve called Brandon Marsh, which is a beautiful, um, yeah, a beautiful, really calming place between sort of Coventry and rugby. So it's just off A45 and it's this hidden paradise in, in some ways. And I have known the reserve for many years now, and I've visited it often. We've been members of Warwickshire Wildlife Trust for a number of years. And um, um, since about 2016 or 17, I've been a conservation volunteer for them as well. And so when I was asked to, to sort of um, be a resident poet there and then write uh, poetry inspired by the reserve, I was absolutely thrilled and very humbled. And I think what has been different in terms of visiting the reserve now as you know as a, as a writer and as a poet in residence in particular has been that I find I find myself paying more attention to things it's almost like I feel this sense that oh I want to do justice to this place that I love so much and yeah so I've just taken a lot more of an interest in terms of the history and how it's evolved. I've spoken to a number of staff who work there and Brandon Marsh is particularly popular among bird watchers. And while I've always loved birds, I've not particularly been a bird watcher. So I can spot like, I, I could spot like, you know, the, the most common birds, but for a lot of the times I wouldn't be able to tell you which ones were migratory, which ones were, you know, native and so on. And I just feel like it's really enriched my life, like, you know, especially after the pandemic, we're so aware of the importance of green spaces. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, so that's sort of, if anything, it's um, uh, heightened my commitment that, you know, green spaces are important, we need to conserve them, wildlife are impo is important, and so on. And, and yeah, like having spent so much time there, I just find myself calmer and happier. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that's that's how it's been. If I can just jump in, because it's really interesting. I have a very different space, but they're both both sites are managed by the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust, who just have this incredible amount of knowledge. These really well trained ecologists. There's so much to learn, but kind of almost diametrically opposite, symmetrically up on the other side of Coventry, there's the Sherborne Valley allotments where I've been based, and this particular site I've been at is managed by the WW team in partnership with Commentary Mind, which is a mental health charity. So although it's a very natural space, it's also a very human space. Mm. So I've been kind of there, um, I've been going down like twice a week for digging sessions and uh, getting to chat to people over, over a spade and a fork and weeding and clearing out 
pots and stuff like that and laying and planting things and it's a really rich site it's been there for 12 years but i only had a couple of meetings with the ecologist uh, there, this, this chap martin who's from the wildlife trust uh, watcher wildlife trust yeah and um most of it has been kind of more invested in mental well-being and uh it's kind of long-term patches managed by the different people that come as volunteers every week so yeah it's it's been a really interesting human-centered way of engaging with, with nature and growing and eating food you grow as a form of kind of empowerment and well-being and that in turn has led me to start thinking oh it's about time i did something with my gun or you know <laughs> that kind of thing um and again the knowledge there is much more kind of folk knowledge so there's a lot of people who know the plants, their purposes, their uses in terms of medicine or healing, uh, or how different things go together, or what's a weed and what isn't, and the different beetles you encounter there, uh, insects, but mostly in terms of how they'll affect uh, the stuff you want to grow compared to the stuff that you want to leave to support what you're growing, like flowers for bees and stuff. So. Awesome, thank you. And um, it seems like you guys talk a lot about um, conservatorship and, you know, taking care of the environment, putting back in, you know, taking back out. And um, I, mean, I was talking to Lewis and he had some great observations about um, about the some of the commissions and the uh, rejuvenation of nature, Lewis. On a, uh... Yeah, yeah, just some following on from what you just said, George, actually. It's interesting you talk about the kind of interconnectivity between human life and the wildlife because you mentioned the whole well-being aspect but there's also the flip side that you brought up in your poem actually with the river kind of carrying the debris created by these humans so is there kind of a side to this relationship between humans and nature that is more overarching or kind of overwhelms one another or is kind of are they in equal balance would you say at the moment Ooh, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, talking with the ecology, ec ecological side of things, the expertise there about the river, I had a little tour. And actually, at that point in Coventry, it's uh, as a site called Light Lakeview Park, lovely big open space. And just after, towards the end of it, the river splits. And Sujana and I were also involved in a walking audio tour we've done as part of the Contain Strong Language Commission. It's over here app, so you can listen to the poems we've written along the trail of the river. And basically, as it hits the city, the, the river essentially becomes a man-made feature. The fork was designed specifically to feed industry and housing along the kind of north side of its flow. And the south side uh, kind of it goes either side of the actual allotments where I'm based. And you'll see again, there's a certain amount of feeding, irrigation and growing there. And then as it kind of re-emerges by a site, uh, a lovely medieval space just on the west side of the butts uh, of the river, uh, you'll see then that it hits a grill after a couple of little bridges and the city just kind of filters it out. But if you spot the different sites through the city where the river's been, you see it was all about the industry. It was all that houses and factories that would drop straight down onto the riverside so that they could load up the barges uh, for transport and trade and that. And I, I guess, I don't know what it's like on the other side, it goes down Charterhouse, but I imagine there again, it's going through Factory Belt on the east side of town and then leads out towards kind of more Oxfordshire way direction and, and Southeast Warwickshire. And there is a sense that people here are more attuned to the idea that we need to be in balance we need to not just take, take, take from nature and assume it will serve our needs and has this infinite resource. There's a bit more working with, and it's for two reasons, I think. One is the amount of energy, resources, financing it takes to really take control of nature and exploit it. And also the other now is our awareness of the finite availability of those resources, that the more we take, the less is left for the next year and the next year. And this is literally happening in terms of soil erosion you know, one of the allotments, uh, one of the plots there in the Sherwin Valley, is being washed into the river slowly. And over millennia, the river has swept that whole period back and forth. And if you go down a couple of meters, you'll find soil uh, built on river pebbles. And that kind of thing makes you aware that we're not just working to the next harvest, the next season, 
you're working here for future generations. And it is there. It's there with a lot of growers and allotments moving away from, say, peat compost, away from um, pesticides, neonicotinoids, all this stuff that's kind of on the cusp of dismantling our food chain. Um, but it's kind of, it's almost there by necessity, you know, rather than um, this immediate long-term awareness of education, let's say. But, you know, that's my perspective, I guess. Well, and you, you talk about um, this, uh, this whole thing of the ecological concerns, the, uh, the pesticides, et cetera, feeding into the river and the damage and the fact that we do have to protect it for the next generations. Um, would you say that expressing these kind of concerns through art, through poetry, et cetera, is more influential to readers and the audience than a sort of just a PSA or a basic kind of uh, announcement or a protest? That's yeah, that's a tricky question. And, and I don't know. I think it's a it's a it's a question of personal preference as well, isn't it? Because not everybody listens to poetry, but also not everybody gets the same kind of messages from from ads or social media or what have you. So we all sort of we all almost we, we are actually increasingly with social media and all the algorithms and stuff, we are in our echo chamber and we hear what we want to hear what we send out into the world so in terms of you know is it are we more able to raise awareness about these difficult issues and they're not even that difficult to be honest you know it's about survival it's about living in harmony with nature but I do think there is more of an awareness for sure people and I think like again places like Workshop Wildlife Trust they've done so much work with schools and children and as a result, parents have been involved in it. So when I started as a hedgehog volunteer, a hedgehog conservation volunteer, I was going around rugby, putting out tunnels um, to sort of um, see if there were any hedgehogs around. So we'd get footprints and then that would help us identify whether or not there were hedgehogs. And if, if there were no hedgehogs, you know, I would go and look at the habitats and then see what might or might, might have led to there not being any hedgehogs. Um, when I first started in 2017, to like now I feel like there is there is an increased awareness and I have spoken to friends and family and have you know the difference between just having a conversation and writing a poetry has poetry made more of an impact I don't know because my friends and family don't always listen to the poetry that I've written but then we, we do have the conversation but the fact that we're writing about it the fact that we're getting commissioned about things like this you know because um yeah like a poet in resident at an allotment. We didn't hear of that very often before, or even uh, I, I think I'm the first person who's been a poet in residence at Workshop Wildlife Trust and they're a massive organization. You know, and I think the fact that these things are happening, we're talking about it, we're writing about it is, is a sign that we are all listening because ultimately when we say are people listening, it's people like you and me and we are listening, we do care and we are writing about it as well. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's a great point in terms of, you know, the people who would listen to this and take it in aren't really the people you need to reach. Um, mm. and, it is, and it raises an interesting question. Um, but it's also interesting, isn't it? Like, yes, they aren't the people who need to be reached, but what do we mean by that? You know, George just said, oh, being in an allotment made me think that I should maybe be growing my own vegetables. You know, so we, we are the people that needs to be reached because we are society, you know, and it's what are the changes that like I will definitely make more of a, more changes. I'll be more aware, more mindful about how I live my life. And hopefully that will influence my friends and my family and my children. And 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 it passes on. You're doing this program and hopefully people will listen to it and you know, they might be, oh, they might not have, not have heard of Brandon Marsh or they might not even know about it for Sherborne and they might look it up. And then, you know, one thing leads to another. And I think we also need to be careful about us and them kind of a thing, like people who need to be reached and people like people like us, that kind of thing. And I think we're all equally responsible and there's always more that each of us could be doing. And if yeah, I can yeah. just jump in, sorry, Harry, it's just that underlying your question is this idea of does poetry matter, mm. right? Yeah, sure. I, I've been actively writing poetry about climate change, about 
catastrophe about all this kind of ecological stuff. And uh, to me, actually, uh, the idea of whether poetry matters, whether any art matters, is, excuse my French, bullshit question, right? Yes, it all matters, else we would have stopped centuries ago, millennia ago. Yes, it's there as an accompaniment to those things that the PSA, the government regulations aren't doing, which is building an emotional connection to those things, our values as a society. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't even be there. Do we need it alongside? Actually, yes, it's necessary, but the question really is, what can it achieve? And that's, I think, what Sajan is saying, is actually being able to connect people in other ways to where they live, their habitat, the food they eat, the way things seem to be crumbling around them. To me, the act of writing it is almost as important as an individual to the act of sharing it with others, which is to say it's psychological or spiritual or whatever terms you have for it. It's a way of forgiving yourself. You know, the, the current, to me, the current condition we live in is one of guilt, that we can't stop climate change, that we've passed the tipping point. And what can we do about that? What can we do but try and forgive ourselves and celebrate what's there and, and maybe step back from consumerism, from, from petroculture and all that stuff and just say it's okay. Um, we don't have control over what's happening now, you know, and writing poetry is a way of processing some really deep and messed up emotions, I think, for a lot of people. I'll say that is that is a great point. The thing of we feel like we can't do anything, you know. I mean, with especially when it comes to climate change, especially when we have the insane amount of pollution caused by these huge companies fed by consumerism. And I, I that's a yeah, that's a great point when you talk about guilt. And I just want to talk about what you were mentioning with a connection um, when it comes to poetry, etc. And you mentioned you both have been contributing to the uh, over here. Um, the over here thing with the, the project where the uh, geographical locations linked to audio poems and as someone who's been studying uh, immersive theatre for the past year or so I found that a bit fascinating I love the idea of finding new ways to you know engage readers writers audiences and I just wondered what your thought was on this new sort of on the digital trail and do you think it allows for a new higher level of connection between a writer and a reader when it comes or a writer and a listener in this case would you like to take that, George? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right, yeah. I mean, for me, it's it's interesting. You can give the digital perspective because I don't actually own a smartphone. I can't listen to these poems now on this trail uh, without a bit of help from the, you know, the, the team that put it together. Um, I, I love the idea, though, that you can listen to work on site, in the site where it was written for. That, to me, absolutely, I, I take in that space when I'm writing. It's a kind of composition driven by um, just the chance encounters with bird life, with the plants that I see, the smells that hit me and all that, the nature of the river on a given day. So yeah, I absolutely want that sense. My poem for that audio trail was specifically written at a very quiet time and I felt like it was a night piece. So I talked with the producers and they actually put in a kind of nightscape night night soundscape to go with it which was really nice of them uh, i wasn't sure if it would work but i also had to record it under a kind of blanket fort in my lounge because of the soundproofing stuff and all that and it, it was very dark in there and i felt like i was in that kind of you know childhood under the covers with a torch type thing reading so it did kind of echo the space where i recorded as well as the site where it was written for um so yeah it was a really good thing I think that poems can be heard on site for me at least. Brilliant yeah I, as I say I'm a huge fan of that kind of in you know the sort of uh, immersiveness and I think it does bring a new level of connection. Um, and speaking of sort of involvement etc um, you're mentioning uh, earlier Susanna your work with the the Wildlife Trust especially uh, Brandon Marsh and uh, Lewis I remember you were, you were telling me about um, about this and uh, I think you had quite an interesting uh, question about this. Yeah because I was doing some uh, research on the whole kind of Brandon Marsh and what the Wildlife Trust is doing and um, I found out about the whole living landscapes projects and how they're trying to um, I think it's generate more of a connection between people like farmers and the natural environment that kind of stuff so did you feel over the course of your uh, residency there that you felt this strong sense of development and that something was happening and that you could see a kind of 
trend of progression while you're writing and did it in any way you know impact your writing at the time um so in terms of um the work 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 show life work show wildlife trust has been doing and in terms of the impact around the world and changes um yes yes absolutely there's a sense of urgency definitely and the sense of things are moving and things are happening and over the course of my residency but also you know having been involved as a volunteer over the years i know that they are going above and beyond everything you know that you normally expect so i know like you mentioned they've, they've worked with farmers to preserve the hedges and then to to encourage wildlife among the hedges they've also <coughs> excuse me um in terms of again hedgehog conservation the, the part where what where i was involved in there's a lot of new build around the West Midlands. And one thing Workshop Wildlife Trust did is they went out of their way to talk to the builders, the companies, to make sure that between fences, gaps were left so hedgehogs could travel, because that has been one of the major reasons for their decline. And um, so they've studied the habitat, but they've also studied human nature and where things are going wrong and, and trying to bridge that gap. And I think, you know, that, that um, yeah, and I, I thought that was really incredible that they made the effort to go and talk to these corporate houses to do it. Um, equally, they also have a nature recovery fund at the moment through which they hope to um, have, you know, wide bits of land um, preserved, preserved, like, you know, because HS2 is happening, has been happening for a while, and it's taken away so much. And that's, you know, part of that is because we, we didn't have that level of control that we thought we had or we should have had and I think by you know by by trying to encourage people to contribute towards a fund that's to preserve wildlife for all of us again that's getting people thinking and involved and alongside um, again like I said before they do a huge amount of work with schools and communities so they go out into local libraries they go into schools but equally they try and enable people from across the the society to come and be involved. So they've got programs for veterans, they've got programs for people with um, mental health issues, they've got people in, in the care system, you know, and I think, yeah, I think they're taking a really holistic, rounded approach, and I definitely feel like things are moving in the right, right direction. Brilliant, thank you. And I just have um, one more question for George. You, um, you've had quite a sort of a, a worldwide experience teaching and, uh, and performing poetry. And, and it very much, it shows in, in your work, but at the same time, it still feels incredibly grounded. And I was just wondering in your time, your res residency here, do you feel like it was a unique experience to Warwickshire and Coventry specifically, or can you relate it to your time in other countries across the world? Hmm. <laughs> That's an interesting question, actually. I've just got back from a summer in, uh, in Greece, in Crete, my family is originally from, and I've been doing a bit of work on we call it the farm. It's not really farming because I'm not a serious farmer when you're there for two months. And um, it's interesting that the concerns, the human, the human concerns translate. Um, and I taught in Botswana about 10 years ago for, for a kind of again a summer camp type system and sort of Singapore. And you can see that in each site, Singapore less so because effectively the island is a city and you don't get much rurality. But in Botswana, it's really present that the the livelihood of the vast majority of people there over 80 percent is pretty much cattle farming and their dependency on issues like water resources are huge same in greece and their concerns with change right now are very much shared that this this anxiety has is spreading across or has already reached places that essentially climate change isn't something in a distant future but has hit them it's already happening in a lot of parts of the world. And so in Crete, weather effects are devastating. The megastorms that you get, they've had huge floods that have literally wiped out access to uh, and electricity to villages in the mountains where my family are from. Um, and you have droughts like several months with no rainfall. And if there's no snow on the mountains come, come June, they're going to be in serious trouble for water by, by September, you know. Um, and the fires that you've been hearing about, that's a real global problem. But when you get down to the ground and the, the labour involved, you know, when, when you're away from the kind of the mass farming, the monoculture agriculture, you can see that there are people who, 
who take a real pleasure from working with the land, despite the fact that it's hard work, it's really good for them. Their, their emotional, their physical, their, their psychological health. And there's something extremely grounding about that idea that this is something that we've been doing as a species for centuries and we need to keep doing. Um, and we need to change actually how we're doing where food comes from. And, and for me, working with people who are just growing as a community, the main thing that comes out is that you don't do it alone. You're not there, one farmer trying to cope with machinery that to cover acres and acres of land. You're there in a group as a community, working it together. Someone does one bit, someone helps with another bit. You trade the food, you bring it to market or swap things with people when you've got too much of it. There's a lot of gift giving in that community, a lot of like knitting between people. And I, I think that's coming back to this word connection. That's what will get us through the crisis, the changes that are coming. The ability to connect in the right way for the right reasons and protect this thing we depend upon for our daily survival, you know. I love I love that idea of sort of connection and community and collaboration um, because it ties into Lewis what we were talking about about you know collaboration with writers uh, if you remember. Yeah that was just more of a me being curious about uh, your work Sijana because as part of the um, Coyle writers group that I did some research on do you feel like this kind of form of collaboration when you work together as opposed to individual work has an effect on how you write and maybe even the content of which you write? That's again a really good question. Um, does, does working in a group impact how I write and um, how I write and why I write? I think it does, you know, I think it does. So being part of the COIL, uh, my writers group that I'm involved in, COIL Writers, um, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think about how it, yes, it does, but I'm just trying to think in terms of how it does. Because I think, you know, along with writing about the environment and climate change and sustainability and, and conservation and things like that, I also write about trauma and womanhood. And, and you know, I grew up in Nepal. I've worked widely across various countries, again, often in isolated rural places and all of that feeds into my writing and I think especially the more difficult darker things that I tend to write about it's been really good to have that support system in place I think and also um, to have a group of people who I don't have to explain anything to regardless yeah. of what it is and I'm making it sound like my writing group is all about dark gloomy stuff it's not at all it's not at all and we are friends outside of our writing as well now we met through our writing but now we're we're very much each other's support system and writing life is very much it's not predictable it's ups and downs you know there are times when you're confident with what you're writing you're happy sometimes you think oh why am I even doing this and in that sense it's been good to have that group sort of pushing me along and feeding into my my own creativity and for me to be able to offer that back. And alongside Coil Group, I'm also developing. So last year I, I came up with this idea of writing the journey and we I ran a couple of me along with a friend, Laura, we, we ran a number of workshops over lockdown throughout lockdown last year, mainly with people from um, refugee and migrant backgrounds. And we had a reading online and Again, this sense of we're all on a journey, but some people feel like their journey is worth sharing. Other people feel like my journey is not interesting. I have nothing to say. And the whole idea of no, actually all of us, you know, all of us are on a journey and all of, we all have a story to say. And it's just that we sometimes tell stories differently and enabling that and op opening the floor for that. And interestingly enough, now we're, we're, we're developing those workshops into a wider scale and we're going to have a show at the Warwick Arts Centre in March next year over several days and we started our rehearsal last um, last week and now instead of like some of us being facilitators some of some of others being participants we're all facilitating we're all participating and so I wrote my own journey as a part of this group because this group encouraged me to write about things that 
I never thought to write about because I thought it wasn't interesting, you know? So this thing about practicing what you preach, I was like, everybody has this journey, everybody should write. But actually I've been on several journeys and there were some things that I thought were not relevant. And these group of women, and, and we did not plan it like that, but we ended up all of us being women the first time we did it. And now it is all of us, all of us are women as well. And they've basically brought that out of me and enabled me to share that story. So now collectively we're, we're bringing this thing to life. And it's incredible. And I would not have done that on my own. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I think even the River Sherborne project where, you know, a lot of us like George and I have not never met. Um, but to feel like there was 12 of us working on this project together. There was. There was something wonderful about it. And also, like, I love theatre. And what I love about theatre is the fact that so many people have to come together to bring it to life. And likewise, while working on with Over Here, we were writing the things, we were all given different spots, but we were actually writing about the same thing, but at, at a different point. And there was, there was something really, there was something really beautiful about it. And also to bring it together, like different people were making soundtracks and then, and then it was all brought together. So when I heard my own piece with the soundtrack, I was like, wow, this is just, yeah. Somebody else read my thing and then and then thought that was a tune to go with it. And it worked beautifully. And we basically made it made a river together. And again, working on that piece, there was a sense of, oh God, I hope my piece fits in with other people's pieces. But equally, when you look at it now, like the other night, Sienna, who did um who, who was involved in this project as well, and I we were both reading at the venue and we both read our river poems and it could not be more different. It was completely different. And yet, you know, and yet we were um, inspired by the same river. And that to me is just beautiful. So yes, again, a roundabout answer to your question, but yes, it does. Influence. And for the most part, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, because it's always about it's always going to be a case of incorporating your surroundings, whether that's subconsciously or consciously. So the end result is always going to be impacted by those around you. So like the River Project, for example, and having those different perspectives really kind of fuses things together and makes something that perhaps someone doing it by themselves wouldn't even be able to fathom because those crossover of ideas just wouldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, absolutely right. I, I love that point. That is amazing. Um, but unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Thank you guys so much for coming here. It's been an amazing discussion. It's been so great hearing all your thoughts and ideas. And for all you guys listening at the moment, uh, if this interests you, check out BBC uh, Contained Strong Language Festival. It'll be happening the uh, 23rd to the 26th of September. And if you're interested in the digital uh, over here trail, be sure to check that out as well. And you can see these amazing poems commissioned from these great artists here. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thanks Thank for having us. Thanks. Really Cheers.